So who followed what she just said that I that I do? Do you get it? I'm network engineering. Perfect. Also data analyst. Because I was listening to that thinking, that's pretty good. So to start off here, my mouse is being jumpy. So a little bit about me before we jump into the, to the meat here. I will start off. I'm a BYU fan. I always have been, uh, particularly for football. If any of you follow, that's not a great year. But <laughs> I made it through the Croton years, and so we'll get through this one too. I, like, I do a lot of running. I do CrossFit. I'm getting into more road cycling. Just like to be active. And my family with five kids, they happen, they keep us very active. Um, so that's a little bit about, about me here. One of the things I want to get right to is themes here. Two main things that I want to highlight while we're talking through some of this is plan, but be flexible. As I've gone through and still have a plan, have a course of action, but it usually doesn't work that way. And so having flexibility to change that. Very much like you may be planning on this being a very good presentation. I need you to be flexible with that, that expectation, okay? The other one is going beyond the job description. We'll little, go a little bit more about that. And I put job, descri job description in quotes because this doesn't just apply to your work, um, your employment. So those are a couple of themes as we, as we go through this. But to start here, I started my uh, post high school here at the community college. I had no idea what I wanted to study. Um, so I, had, I picked a major, started classes. Um, I did a year of school before I left on an LDS mission, came back, did a few more years here. I ended up spending, not counting the two years on the mission, I ended up spending four years here total. Um, Nine majors had part of that. I didn't realize at the time, but I was waiting for my wife to graduate from high school so she could get here, so we could meet, and then I could move on. Um, so I spent four years here at the two-year school, but then only a year and a half at the four-year school once I moved up to the U. But I bounced around from computer information systems to computer science, electrical engineering, a bunch of different cases in the business school, business, marketing, accounting. Um, Finally ended up with my, my associates in business, and actually as well um, in generals. Going up to the U, after that, for my bachelor's degree, I was actually going to be an accounting major. But before classes even started, I realized, because doing the classes here, I really did well at accounting. I did well in those, co in those courses. Um, but as I thought about it, I didn't really care all about all the rules and where all the pennies go. I wanted to make the money work and understand how the money works. So I switched to finance before the classes even started. And for me, that, that, was, that was the right decision. The irony is the very first major I declared out of high school, just picking one out of the hat, was credit and finance. So I made a full circle, came back all the way uh, to finance. So got the bachelor's degree, did a little bit of work, and then went back from my master's. Um, my original plan was to do an MBA. My experience at the, in my undergrad, which we'll get into a little bit, was more like an MBA type experience. And so I elected to go deeper and wanted to get a master's of science in finance. And so the U was the only school around here that offered that. Everywhere else from BYU to Westminster, Utah State, all have MBAs with emphasis in finance. So I ended up back at the U for my master's of finance. So that's my academic path, but to the theme of going beyond the job description, the degrees are definitely helped me get to where I'm going and where I am, but it's what I was doing while I was at these schools that really made the difference. So the first little while while I was at the community college, I was just going to class. Um, when I got into the business school and I was actually a marketing major, I found out about DEX, which is now Collegiate DECA. It's the same thing, they just changed the name. Back then, it was DEX. And I just thought, you know what, if I'm going to do this marketing thing, I'm going to get involved and start doing that. So I got involved in our local chapter of DEX. 
I was the VP of communications my first year working through that. Through working with them and getting the experience um, of doing that, I got in touch with the, uh, the Utah Entrepreneur Challenge. Have any of you heard of that? that run, that's run out of the University of Utah. Statewide business plan competition for collegiate students. So any collegiate student in the state of Utah can submit a business plan. Winner gets $40,000 to start, help start their business. They came to the school looking for people to help get things going here. And our division chair at the time, he sent them to Dex, sent them to me. I was over communication. So I was actually going to simply just work with them and be their representative on campus the year after I did the VP of communications. But as things happened, somebody was supposed to be our state VP, fell through, and I ended up doing the state VP role for our Dex as well. But doing all that set me up so that when I went up to the University of Utah, I was the student chair for the Utah Entrepreneur Challenge and was able to run that business plan competition. Um, we raised $200,000 to run the program. Um, the school was able to send me out to San Francisco and met with one of their, one of their larger donors, big venture capitalist, billions of dollars in, in management. Um, had a great meeting. I didn't think much of it. I thought it was a great meeting. But the dean of, our, of the business school later told me that uh, shortly after we made that visit, um, that, uh, that donor sent a check for $100,000 to the school because of our conversation. He was impressed with us. And it was a unique opportunity to, to learn from him, find out more about that, not because of anything I was doing in the classroom, but because of being involved outside of the classroom. Doing that set me up for my internship as I finished up my undergrad with a group called Land Equity Partners. Um, I was the finance intern working through, that was private equity, residential real estate. And so was able to do that for a little bit. But then as I was graduating, again, because of my connections and the networking that I was able to do through the Entrepreneur Center, um, I had some people contact me about uh, starting up a business. And so me and with a couple others, we started a company called Plasma Got. Plasma glass. It's not one of these awesome stories you hear, but it was cool to get in, do a startup. Did it for about six months. We were actually going to raise more capital and had an opportunity to just sell the business. Um, it wasn't one of these like dot coms where you sell it for millions of dollars. We basically got the debt out that we had in it, but it was a cool experience for me to, to get in there. And from there, I was able to actually go back to Land Equity Partners full time. The whole plan was to go there, work for a couple of years, then go back for my master's, was the plan from the beginning. After about a year of working with them, they liked what I was doing, I liked what I was doing, so we kind of shifted that plan. They worked with me where I worked with them while I did my master's degree, um, went through that and, and planned to be there longer term. That was from 06 to 09. Anybody recall what was going on in real estate in financial markets from 2006 to 2009? No. <laughs> Not great. <laughs> it's the short of it. Salt Lake was a little bit, we, our bubble wasn't as big as the, the Phoenixes and Las Vegas and stuff like that. But so from a real estate perspective, we were in small markets. We, our projects were in Bozeman, Montana, Driggs, Idaho. We had some in Heber, um, Heber City out there. Our offices were in Park City. But when the uh, real estate drug the entire financial markets down, it really became, they, call it, they started calling it the liquidity crisis where you couldn't get debt. You just couldn't get any. We didn't, have, we didn't require a lot of debt, but we did require some. And so when we started not being able to get debt, cash that we had that was supposed to go support operations was having to go support projects. And so finally, this whole company was five business, five general partners. Um, two of which ran the day-to-day, -day, the CFO and the CEO. And then the project manager worked with the CEO, and I worked with the CFO, and we had an office manager. I mean, that was the whole company. So one day, the, f the partners finally sat us down and said, OK, the good news is we can make payroll to the end of the year. This was about in October. I said, the bad news is we can only make payroll to the end of the year. And I said, I know I'm the one giving you the financial models telling you that. It's nice we're finally having this conversation. Um, all the scenarios we were having to run to stay cash positive were becoming further and further outlandish and unbelievable and not likely. 
uh, to happen. And so we, it was around that same time, given how small that company was, I was running out of opportunity. I had kind of grown where I could, and for me to keep growing, I needed to start doing what the CFO was doing, which doesn't make a lot of sense. He was there for a reason. So it actually was converging paths that came together kind of at a good time. And so I started looking. I was able to line things up, and I joined Omniture. I left LEP on Friday and started at Omniture on the Monday. Um, and so I joined Omniture. Does anybody recall back when it was Omniture? Anyway? <laughs> Some of you talk about it. it was actually two days ago, eight years ago, two days ago is the, when the acquisition was finalized with Adobe. So I was with Omniture about nine months before the acquisition to Adobe. So that's actually how I came to work for Adobe, is I worked for Omniture. Our team got cut in about half at the, at the time of the acquisition. I was supporting the sales and marketing teams. Oftentimes when you do, when you have these acquisitions, there's a variety of reasons to acquire. Omniture had done a handful of these acquisitions where we just wanted the intellectual property. We didn't want anything else about the company. We wanted to buy them, buy their product, and just strip everything else out. We didn't really need anything else. Other times, you, sim you want to enhance what you're doing. With Adobe, when they acquired Omniture, it was completely new line of business for Adobe. They weren't in doing anything similar to what Omniture was doing. So Omniture is now the core, is what the digital marketing is what we call it, business within Adobe. Is the Omniture, the legacy Omniture business is the base for that digital marketing. So when they acquired, Adobe, acquired Omniture, they basically wanted to just stand it up as a run, as a siloed business within Adobe. But some of the GNA functions, because Omniture, we were corporate. Adobe already had corporate. So accounting, HR, procurement, those types of teams were hit pretty hard as far as the acquisition was concerned. Our fp &A team had, I think we had about 14 or 15 people worldwide. We had a few people on, over in, in London on the Omniture team. Um, that got stripped down to about eight. Um, I made that cut and have been able to continue through for the last eight years um, with Adobe. So come this January, it'll be nine years in total. That's important because Adobe gives you a, a sabbatical every five years. So a year from January, I'll be due for my second sabbatical, which is it, it basically they give you four to five weeks off, paid time off to just go do what you want to do. Um, and so that's always a, a, nice, a nice benefit. So over the years, I started as a financial analyst with Omniture. Over time, I was supporting sales and marketing. Started, uh, moved up to become a senior analyst, supported marketing and more of the senior sales of supported engineering, technical operations, product support, those types of things. So that's that. Now, a little bit more about Adobe. One of our taglines, if you will, is this changing the world through digital experiences. So what products, what experiences do you guys think about when you think about interacting with Adobe? Uh, that's just art programs, straight up. Okay, art programs. What was, there was another one over here. I said Photoshop. Photoshop specifically. What else? I mean, you've also got Flash Player, but that's a dying service. Yep. And we're, and we're killing it off too. We're not yeah. investing in that one anymore. That's just yeah. going to, that'll bleed out. PDFs, Acrobat. Right, those are all Adobe. Now, the armature business, the digital marketing stuff, you don't know it, but you interact with it every day. Um, you're not the Adobe customer. The entities you're interacting with are Adobe's customer for the digital marketing stuff. Um, the Best Buys, Disney, REI, you go to their websites, you're interacting with Adobe products. You're interacting because we're helping Best Buy REI, count, I mean, the list goes on and on, helping them optimize those digital experiences between your computer to your phone to your tablet. To be, especially if you have a login, you're, you're, you're telling that entity who you are. And our, our software can help that company keep track of what are you doing, what are you liking, what are you not doing, 
and how can they continue to optimize those overall digital experiences. So from creation, all the art, the creative tools, creating all that content, to publishing it, to monetizing it and tracking it, you have the creative, the creative and the digital marketing sides of, of Adobe. So we very much have that consumer side, which is what most people are familiar with. But that was the business that Adobe was getting into when they bought Omniture. It was that digital marketing enterprise, business to business that they've now had. We're one of the largest SaaS, software as a service okay. companies in the world now. Whereas, you know, eight, nine years ago before Adobe acquired Omniture, they had hardly any SaaS. And so over the last eight years, they've been able to grow that uh, significantly. So a couple metrics about the company. You know, we're 17,000 plus in employees. Um, last year was just shy of six billion in revenue. This year, we'll see how Q4 goes, but we'll be in the range of about seven billion um, in revenue across the, or across the company. Um, a, a thing that's really important to Adobe is environmental um, being responsible. And so 78% of the employee base work in LEED certified office buildings. And so our, off, our site down here is, I believe it's gold certified, but should be platinum soon. Um, there's a point scale with LEED as you do different things. And as you get, accumulate so many points, you get certain levels of, uh, of that. And so that's a big deal to Adobe. And another community involvement, you know, nearly $38 million last year was donated to the community, various different initiatives, sponsorships, as well as uh, grant programs that we've, we run for different, uh, different uh, nonprofits in the communities that we operate. This is, this is an interesting story. When you look at Adobe, this, this basically goes back to around the time of the acquisition of Omniture. Um, so you can see down here, it was staying fairly flat. Prior, if we came, if we came back even further, Adobe is about 35-ish years old now. The highest the stock price had ever gotten to is about here. It was kind of the all-time high watermark that we'd ever had. Um, does anybody recall what Adobe announced? Let's see, it was right in this time frame on the creative stuff. Com they merged everything, right? The subscription base? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we went from box product, perpetual license sales, to the subscription. And notice what the stock price did. And just kind of just hung on. The street, when we announced that, they, they were like, we get the story, we'll believe it when we see it. Nobody ever been able to do it. They, they really thought it was not going to work, basically, is the short of it. Um, but over time, we were able to kind of finally get them to start seeing, because in the short term, our revenue went down. Rather than getting $800 for a single sale, we started getting $50 a month. So what used to get a revenue all at once was now going to take us a couple of years to get that same amount of revenue. Yeah, it changes your cost profile. For sure, there's cost to hosting and being a, make it downloadable, but the the barrier to entry, customers that couldn't go out and drop six eight hundred bucks, could maybe go out and spend fifty bucks a month, and you could go out and do it for a few months and shut it back off, and so, the other thing is, previously we were very dependent on our release cycles, we'd have a release every eighteen months or eighteen months or so because we needed the revenue. We'd build up, get the features, release the features, and we'd see this mountain of revenue come in because everybody wants to upgrade and update. And then that would kind of tail off and we'd, we'd go through it again. Consumers were concerned that we would stop investing. We'd stop releasing those features. And so over time, as we showed, we weren't held to those 18-month release cycles. We were starting to have monthly releases. We were able to release features as they were ready. Consumers started to see that and gain confidence in that. And it was right around in here, as you can kind of see this inflection shift, where we were able to see that revenue would come back. Revenue did dip down, but it started to come back up as we have the, we call it the stacking effect of the ARR, the annual recurring revenue. As we got subscribers stacked up, we got the revenue back up. The street was starting to see that and starting to get pretty bullish about it. They were getting pretty excited. 
their forecasts were up and up and up. And so, honestly, just this last week, I wish I could tell you what we announced there to make us jump $25, but I'm not sure exactly what it was. We had our annual MAX conference, and we always have a financial analyst where we release the next year's guidance and stuff. They really liked it because it went up 25 bucks in one day. Yeah, but um, stock price is all speculation. So it is. It, it, it's futures. And any finance classes that you may take where they talk about rational market theory, it's garbage. Yeah. Markets are anything but rational. In academics, when you need to model things, you can't model something that's not at least assumed to be predicted. So I get in, in the academic sense, yes, to build these different models, you've got to assume certain things. In the real world, markets are anything but rational. They're very reactive. That's where you'll see some of these. We'll have an earnings call, and every time there's, an, there's a huge jump. It's either up or it's down, and then it comes back. Within the first 24 hours of our earnings call, and it's a lot of companies, there's this reaction, and then it works its way back to where it really should have been. So markets are very reaction. It yeah, somebody's, somebody's clicking the button. But at the end of the day, that is used as what, what's Adobe's value today. It's that, you know, that stock price. It could drop, it could change. Um, so over time, we've been able to experience this digital shift, this digital transformation that other companies now are coming to us with our creative and digital marketing products asking us to help them do the same thing. And so it's also created an opportunity for us to grow our own revenue by saying, hey, we've done this. We have the tools to help other companies uh, do, uh, do very similar things. So to get in specifics, have you ever heard of FP&A? Anybody else? A couple? You know what it stands for? You want to guess what it stands for? Financial planning and analytics. Close. Very financial planning and, and analysis. Okay. So, but what does that actually mean? So this is something that I've, I've had, and in full disclosure, this is what my mom thinks I do, and my mom is actually here. She works in the bookstore. Here. How long have you worked in the bookstore now? Twenty-five. 30, forever. <laughs> so this is what my mom thinks I do here. My friends think, you're a bean counter. think we do that. <laughs> and I, whenever I do hear that, I correct people. I said, no, that goes back to I left accounting and went to finance. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what society thinks I do, back to talking about the street things. Investors, you know, the street, we have no idea what we're doing. This is what I think I do. We're really driving things. But most of the time, this is usually what I end up doing. Yeah, crying, sitting at your desk, looking at multiple screens. I don't have four screens, but nonetheless, oftentimes, that's, that's really what, what we end up doing. Um, so FP&A, in reality, we're a support organization. Within Adobe, we talk about customers utilizing um, improving the customer experience, things like that. For teams like mine, for the most part, we don't interact with Adobe's customers. Um, our customers are the internal teams. You know, all these teams down here that I've listed, those are various teams that I've supported over the years. And so it's our job to partner with them, understand their business, help them understand their business. Um, to drive things forward, help them understand what needs to change. We often, as part of that, we're in charge of the revenue and expense forecasting. And so we are, we, so one of the things I look with accounting, accounting looks at up to today. And once things are booked, they don't care where certain invoices and stuff are booked to, as long as they get booked, they get put in the right place. We look at history to the point where it helps us forecast the future. And so we're looking, we're the ones that are telling accounting to try to make sure things get booked in the right place so that we can have the visibility we need to forecast where we might be going in the future. And so we're in charge of uh, doing all those types of things. And those processes are often the times where I hold my head in my hands and just we work through it. I call that the broccoli of the FP&A. It's good for you. Keeps you healthy. Somebody's got to do it. It's, 
Isn't that what excites me about work? It's, that, it's this third bullet, the partnering with the business leaders. Engaging with them, understanding their business, driving their business, helping them understand their business in ways that they haven't thought of it or tried to drive it before. And there's a variety of things that we have to do to, to do that. So within Adobe, our, our core uh, standards are to be genuine, to be innovative, to be exceptional, and to be involved are the four kind of tenets that we have as an employee base. And so as a company that has two of its core tenets are to be innovative and exceptional, remember my, one of my uh, call outs for the presentation was to go beyond the job description. And so in, in school, like I noted, the job description there, you'd simply go to class, get the grades, go to work, go home. But going beyond what is necessarily expected and getting involved in those extracurricular groups is what got me where I am today. And so similarly at Adobe, going beyond the job description. Now, one thing, this doesn't mean do more than you're being asked to do, but make what, do, what you're doing better than where you were at. And so at Adobe, one of the, the things that I've had to do is these are some of the things I've looked at, is as I've taken on a new role, I look to find out a lot of the what, but often I'm trying to find out what are we doing to figure out why are we doing it. Um, and there's plenty of times where that answer is a good answer, other times it's not a great answer. There's cases where we're just not, uh, there's cases where there's, we're doing things that aren't creating any value. Okay? Or we're busy enough doing things, there's things that we could and should be doing to add value, but we're not doing them. Figure out why people haven't done them, and then at the end of the day, figure out how to do them. So a lot of it really comes down to how do I get from, this is what my job description is, because this is our understanding of what this role should be when I took it on. How do I make this more? Not necessarily take other people's directives and other people's jobs and make them mine. How do I make my job more? And honestly, I've had a few cases when I've, as I've worked through this, that it could, some people would view some of it as um, job limiting, as in I've automated certain things that now I used to have to do that, but now I don't have to do that. And so some people see that as removing a line item from my job description, which removes my value to the company. When in reality, yeah, that's how it works. So like, it just adds more value to you. And if I don't fill that in with something else, it would be. But by automating and creating those things, now I can get to some of these things that other people haven't been able to get to because they spent so much time working on other stuff, they can't get to the other things. So, a little more detail on each of these. So, identifying work that isn't adding value. So, in my experience, we've had dashboards a bunch of times, kind of these first two go together, chasing down data and details because someone's curious, because we have data. I've seen a bunch of cases where teams are building dashboards, they look really good, the data is accurate, but at the end of the day it's like, what's it telling you? Why is anybody even looking at this? You know, we send it to our business partners, okay. And, and I know one of my tests is when I would send these, We'd set up a meeting to review with the business partner, and oftentimes, they've never opened it until we're sitting in front of them to do the meeting. So clearly, we're not creating content for them that's valuable enough for them to want to see it until we're sitting in front of them. So is there value there? Um, the quantity of reports, okay? Honestly, as I work a lot of this stuff, it just makes me feel sad, okay? It's just, but, this last one. It's the way we've always done it. That drives me crazy. I hate that answer. Um, almost to a fault, I think, in some cases. If that's the answer, something just inherently makes me want to change it just because it needs to change. We need a better reason than that. And sometimes it's because people just haven't engaged enough to know. And other times, that really is just all we have. So identifying value gaps is 
re requiring us to honestly just ask more questions, to get engaged into the business. What should we know that we don't? You know, what questions aren't being answered? What questions aren't being asked? And a lot of times, people just don't want to go there. It's like, somebody else should be asking those questions. That's not my role. I run into that a fair amount in FP&A, where people see that's not really our thing. Our business partners, you know, they ask us questions, we help them answer them. And my approach has been, while that's true, we are closer to the data than anybody. We should be taking those questions to the business partners. So this can often be the trick. Because in some cases, people have looked at those value gaps. But there's often a reason they haven't been filled. Data integrity, I ran into it a lot, where you think you've got the data as you dig into it. It's kind of garbage data. You can't really use it because of any number of nuances to it. You can't get to the data altogether. There's technology issues, there's bandwidth, there's scalability problems. And then sometimes people are just unaware. And then in some cases, they're just downright fearful. Okay, fear of failure, fear of expectations that we can't meet and exceed. So at the end of the day, it's time to just jump in. And I've done this a number of times where you have to partner with other teams. If there's data problems, go find out who owns that data, find out what's driving that, how can we change that. And it takes that initiative, because oftentimes those teams, they're just doing what they've always done. And nobody screamed at them. Nobody's, not that you scream at people, but nobody has screamed fire, so to speak, and so there's no reason for them to change. And so as we work with those teams, the functional teams, improve the data, change the data, change the availability, opportunities that weren't previously there can start to come up. In some cases, I've had to go out and learn new systems, new technologies. Um, within a company the size of Adobe, I'm not really able to like go adopt my own and say, hey, Adobe, we're going to start using Tableau because I want to. But we've had a number of cases where Adobe, our finance systems team, will say, hey, we're starting to use Tableau. It's an available tool for you. And a lot of FP&A, they just kind of sit back and be like, I, I, I like Excel. I like my pivot tables. Now, and I <laughs> honestly, I love Excel. I've been able to do some amazing things in Excel. But compared to the Tableaus and the Power BIs of the world, it just doesn't scale the same way. And so as I've engaged and worked through and learned those systems, it's completely opened up my scalability, my productivity. And as I've worked and shared some of these things with some of my counterparts, they're like, how did you learn? And it's like, I just jumped in and figured it out. You just jump in, go do it. And then as you do this, as you get the data, as you get the systems, now you can build dashboards, build visibility based on value, not just because, hey, look, we've got this data. Let's pick, make a pretty graph and send it to somebody because we have it. It's, we have this question. We don't understand it. Now we have data. Let's answer that question and provide value. So naturally, we've gone through the other emotions. We get to here, right? And you get Kung Fu Panda. It's not quite ninja, but Kung Fu's close, right? Um, but it's also, it can be joyful, too. So one example, um, just this year, I took on a new role um, supporting our, some of our solution teams. And so attrition is one of the things that we, work, that we look at. And so naturally, we have a new, new book of business that we're closing all the time. But naturally, some level of that business is falling off. And so in attrition, you've got lost customers that just straight up went away for whatever reason. Uh, and downsell. They might have been a million dollar contract and they downsized to a half a million dollar contract. Again, number of reasons of why, but we would see that as a half a million dollar attrition event. Pushed renewals is another one where somebody's up for renewal this, this month and they don't. For whatever reason, the contract slides, the new contract doesn't get closed. We haven't lost the deal, but it didn't get closed. And so for right now, we recognize that entire contract as attrition because it got pushed. Mm -hmm. But then if it closes next month, it comes back as trailing books. So there's these nuanced moving pieces to what we report as this attrition number. You know, we had $10 million of attrition, but it's this ins and outs and all these different things. As I came into the group, the reporting around attrition was we provided the top 10 customers that we lost and the top 10 pushed renewals. 
cool, right? Um, try to put your, your business partner hat on. You own this business. You're trying to understand your attrition. And the reports you get are you had $10 million in attrition, and here's your top 10 lost customers and your top 10 pushed renewal customers. What do you know about your attrition now? All you know is who left and who's not why. Not, yeah, like okay. there, there's no reason that data is supposed to be there because it's not, you can't do anything about it. Yep. Unless you want to go and try it, and like. It tells you what happened. Business. Right. You could see if any of them have anything in common to see. Like, yep. You need additional data for that. Yep. So, and to be fair, when we list the 10, we do say, this is the customer, this is the region, this is the products they traded, this is how much it was, this is, so some, some data is there, some. And there are some cases where those top 10, between those two categories of top 10, it could account for 70% of the entire attrition. You know, if we had some big customers or something. It, it tells you what happened. Is there anything here that can help you manage your attrition in the future? I mean, those customers are gone. You could look at if there's other customers. And so this is often one of these, it's kind of like the why questions from before. When we look at some of the reports, we'd be like, okay, so what? You gave me this data, so what about that? What should this be telling me? Or is this just data? And so I kind of, again, trying to figure out the what, figure out the why, digging into, and this was a case where the data wasn't very clean, it wasn't very automatable, but we dug in, we got the right teams involved, we got it automated, so where, because honestly, full disclosure, our attrition, our official source of record for attrition was an Excel file that we got every quarter. And so if you wanted to look at trended attrition details over the last three years, you had to look at 12 different Excel files, which doesn't work. So we worked through, we've been able to compile that, we've got a SQL database now that we can update with those, that data, and now this data has been amended, this is sample data. But now this is a Tableau dashboard where we're able to do a lot more with attrition. What's going on with attrition in the business? So the quick orientation here is each of these bands across the top here, each of these colors represents the customer size. How big was that customer that it traded? And here we have them based on their, their deal value, their ARR, their annual recurring revenue that we lost. And this is just pure number of customers. This is the same data just on 100% scale. So this is giving you a distribution sense where this is showing you the nominal, the nominal trend as well. What does this tell you? It's a little bit more depressing. <laughs> no, it, it, it shows you what the impact is. And it shows you like what the reality of these mean versus, hey, look, here's a top 10 in this, bam, that's gone. Here's a top 10 in this, bam, that's gone. Yep. But like this shows you like where you're where it's all like coming from, where where your attrition is starting, where it's like going and like and you can see who you're having, you know, the issues with. Yeah, yeah. Now, why did you say it's more depressing? Because you're seeing it. Like, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, if I look at that and I'm like... You'd rather be just ignorance is bliss? Absolutely. Just <laughs> like, if you're, like, if you can't do anything about it, I would probably, yeah, I'd rather stay in the dark. But now, if you want to be objective and say, like, this is what I need to do to fix it, now, as you see this, is there something you can do about it? You can't do anything about these customers. But you can do something for the future. Like, you right. can change. Yeah, like, this is who I need to focus on. This is the... Like, if, I'm, if my primary concern is our customer count, I want to be able to show the street that our customer count is growing. I'm not as worried about the deal value. That's not really the case. But if, big if, what would this tell you we've really got to focus on? Your higher-end customers grew in the millions. Uh, the, mm, I can't, like, I can't see what we are focusing on, but you need to focus on that, like, the, those numbers. Well, if you want more customers, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what you're saying. You want to send those numbers. Single subscribers or more of the smaller deals. Yeah. Because this, again, this is attrition. So, like, 80% customers that we're losing are less than a $100,000 account. 
So if my motivation is keep that customer count as high as possible, I have to figure this out. We are bleeding small customers like crazy. Now, if my motivation is really more on driving the, the deal value, this is still not immaterial, but we've got 80% of the customers driving you know, 30 to 40% of the ASV, or the ARR, of the, of the attrition. Compared to the million or 500 to 1 million, then like, that's a huge chunk mm -hmm. out of just one it, person. It's this, it's this center band here. Naturally, these honestly are going to happen, and they're large enough They've, they've already got dedicated teams that are working and doing everything we can. These are the types of customers that will actually build customization into their, into their application to keep them in play. You know, customers that are $5 million, we're going to do all kinds of stuff. So we're, not to say there's no more we could do, but that was, it, was, it was this center band, as we shared this with our business partners, that opened their eyes. This wasn't shocking to them. It was nice to kind of have data to say what their, their gut feel over time had been. And so that was nice. But it was, it was this center band that they didn't quite have as good a feel for. And so we're still working through what this means. But this is now changing how we talk about attrition. We're changing the actionableness, if that's a word. We make up words all the time, of the data. Again, we've got big data. We've got all kinds of data. It's in, Excel files everywhere, but we've been able to pull it together, use technology, and now we can reshape how we can drive that attrition. And we've got a skadoosh. Okay? So to just wrap up again, planning but be flexible. Data is going to change. Technology is going to change. So just like we've built this in Tableau, there's a reason we built SQL on the back end. SQL is allowing us to scale. So if we move from Tableau to, say, Power BI with Microsoft, it's just which tool do we connect to the SQL database, and we can be flexible. We've got a plan. We're working with Tableau, but we've got to be able to be flexible with it. And then going beyond the job description again, most companies can find people to do a job. But what companies need, and oftentimes companies don't even realize what they need, is people that can come in and take that job and create value. And, and do more than what they originally had planned or thought they needed within that, within that job. And those are going to be the ones that will that'll be, uh, be kept around. Adobe is, we're in a unique spot for, for a company of our size. Um, through the, through the, uh, the strategy shift of the, the subscription with the creative model, driving more adoption with the, the digital marketing. Within the next 10 years, I mean, it's really tough to say what technology is going to be doing. But I would say within the next five years, I would think that Adobe's revenue is likely to double from where we are today. Well, it's an easy, easy thing to say. And so as we, as we see that now, competition's coming in, part of that growth is going to be acquisition. As the Adobe continues to grow, we will buy um, build on products to expand our portfolio. We'll buy other products to enhance um, combined. We, one of the acquisitions we're still working through and, and integrating is we bought, it was kind of a competitor that had a, an analytics product that they actually wanted to divest out of. So we just bought that one product from them and we're migrating those customers over to our platform. So there's going to be different types of things like that as the market consolidates, as those because you have those cases where there's a lot of competition, but as the market matures, it has to consolidate to maintain maturity. And Adobe's in it between capital and the market position, we're definitely in position as that market matures to be able to be a, a source of that consolidation of the market. So I think they're going to largely be a, one of the big, big players in digital marketing as long as there is digital marketing out there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when I think of Adobe, I think a lot of like Photoshop and yep. those creative tools. But how much of the company now is is more of the omniture stuff yeah. as a percentage? Then? It's a growing percentage. It's still less than half. So, off the top of my head, of the, the call it this year will be about seven million in revenue for the entire company. I think it's about two. 
I think it's about two of it is digital marketing. Um, it doesn't seem all that long ago that the goal was to get digital marketing to a billion. Um, but we passed, we blew past that mark only just a few years ago and we're already at two plus billion. So I would say to tag along with his question in the next five to 10 years, because digital marketing is the growth is the hyper growth, I should say. Subscription as being a $5 billion company on the creative side, it's growing at a rate companies that size don't grow, 20% 20 per, 20 a year. Um, and so that's gonna continue to grow, but over the next five to 10 years, I don't know if it'll get quite 50-50, but it'll, it'll get a lot closer as digital marketing continues to expand. There's a lot more market opportunity to still take advantage of, whereas creative already is, owns most of the market. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's increasing. Yeah, where does the creative side go? When you say you, they're acquiring, are they acquiring different sort of art, like companies that deal with media and yeah. how you process media? There's, there's different things there. Um, I think as we do more acquiring, it'll be more on the digital marketing side, but there's definitely still, because most people don't realize this, going back when Adobe got into the creative world with Photoshop, it was an acquisition. Um, they bought Photoshop and brought it in and then have made it what it is. Um, but, uh, and so there's still a few things where somebody will have a, a unique technology that we can maybe either add as a new offering or perhaps bundle into some of our other existing features and stuff. Um, it'll be those types of things, rounding out the, to make sure, making sure we're communicating the market, we're continuing to drive the innovation in the products, that kind of stuff. Yeah. What do you guys do to combat? I, I feel like a lot of the, the viruses I hear of okay. are replicated from Adobe Flash Player and oh, really? like-minded sources. You know, it's just updates. updates. Uh, updates. updates. So how do you how do, how do you combat something like that? Because I feel like it kind of draws. I mean, yeah. I don't have Flash Player on my computer for that very reason. Yep. Yeah. You know. Well, and a lot of it comes down to it's easy to replicate so people think they're downloading from Adobe and they're not. Um, and so, I mean, and that's Flash Player and other things. I mean, we're largely trying to do everything we can to help people get the true sources of, like, get to Adobe's website and you're not going to be downloading that stuff with it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and, and that's part of the digital age of things. And that's where some of the subscription offerings that we can, can do can actually help Adobe, at least with privacy, um, piracy, those types of things where we're, we can control the distribution channel more directly. Um, but it, it is definitely one of the challenges of the digital age that we're part of. That consumers need to be as savvy as possible to make sure they know what source they're really dealing with when they're downloading stuff. So what, what would you say as a percentage the, the focus of cybersecurity is with Adobe? I don't know about a percentage, but over the last few years, it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty significant area of focus. I would say going back six, seven years ago, it was a focus, but it wasn't a driving focus that it has been the last five or six years. Um, we have a, um, I don't know if he's the CSO, he's like the chief security, I don't know if that's technically, but he's, it's basically if he says we've got to do stuff, we do it. Um, and so there's cases where um, we've put budget there and had to pull, pull other things off the table because we can't, we just can't afford to skimp on, this, on the security um, on those fronts in a variety of different ways doing all the stuff that we're doing. So it is, it is definitely a high priority. We, we do what we got to do to stay compliant and making sure our customers are secure. So, yeah. Just kind of want to add to yeah. that too. It's like, as everything moves more in a digital trend, like where it's all online services and we come and we become more interconnected, uh, the shift in focus, like from a consumer to like a producer of services, um, we're talking about people who can literally send you forty-eight bytes of data to your computer that your computer will just parse, like it was an IP address received, and it'll infect your computer. But like the thing is, is that you can't walk against that, but then again, you're never going to get it because you're not the target. The target's going to be these major corporations, and they're going to have fail-safe in place and redundancy in place to keep that happening on a large scale. 
So the thing is, is like, what you should be worried about is just what you're doing on your own computer, you know? Um, and like, as we keep moving, the, the cybersecurity is going to blow open as more devices and more ways to connect people are like being developed. And that goes back to kind of my plan, but be flexible. It's, it's going to be constantly changing, so everything you do. Yes? Um, my question is, what is, um, what is in for us, right? Are you guys trying, are you guys having plans to invest more in Lehigh, to generate more jobs, or yep. generate more opportunities for us, or another building maybe, or something like that? Yes. So, yeah, the question around the investment here in Lehigh. So. Uh, Lehigh today is already, I want to say it's the third or fourth largest um, office employee base for Adobe. Yeah. San Jose is our headquarters, is by far the biggest. And then actually we've got a really big office in Bangalore, India. Um, but it was recently announced just a few months ago that we're, build, we're basically doubling the size of the current office in Lehigh. So we've got the long, if you've seen our campus, we've got the long office <laughs> building. They're building a whole second one of those Bottom over the next the, few years. Yeah, we already own all of the land out there. We actually have the land for a third one of those as well down the road. Okay. Um, but they're telling us by summer of 2020 that next building will be online. Okay. That will give us almost 1,200 more seats for employees. Naturally, it's going to take years to hire into that, but it, it gives us, we were running out of seats. We weren't really able to hire much in Lehigh the last year or two because we just didn't have anywhere to put them anymore. Yeah, put the call center on, on Westfield and then close down that one. So it's going to bring everything to Lehigh and make one big, big thing. Probably. I don't know specifically on those things, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's going to completely open up our physical restraints uh -huh. um, so that we can hire and put the people where we need them, not where can we cram them and poke <laughs> them and put them. So yeah, that, that is coming over the next couple of years. A um, lot, lot, more, lot more seats coming to Lehigh here. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for having me.